My name is James Krause, and I wrote a book called Bird in the Deep, which tells the true story of the USS Partridge. The Partridge was a minesweeper that was sunk off the coast of Normandy during the D-Day invasion. My grandfather was a sailor aboard the Partridge, and my whole life I've heard stories that this ship was the basis for Herman Wilkes, the Kane Mutiny. I set out more than ten years ago to find out what that true story was. I think that when you set out to find a true story of anything, you find real people, real adventure, and their true stories that are sometimes more interesting than what you were searching for in the first place. First, a little bit about the USS Partridge. Like I said, she was sunk off the coast of Normandy during World War II, but was actually built at the end of World War I. These types of minesweepers, called bird boats, were built to clear off a massive wall of mines called the Great Barrage. It was laid down by the Allies to pen in German submarines. After this mission, bird boats were scattered to the winds and were hardly ever used as minesweepers again. When I started research on the book, I began with the men who served aboard the ship. I had a list of members of a reunion group that last gathered in the late 1990s. I started with Bill Ames, who organized that group. Bill and his wife Dottie met me in Milwaukee, and brought a huge scrapbook of photos and newsletters from after the war. Bill was among the longest-serving members of the Partridge crew and was a wealth of information from the missions in the Caribbean to the Atlantic crossing and her participation in D-Day. This is Bill getting his Purple Heart after recovering from injuries he received when the ship was sunk. Another resource was Floyd Pedersen. Floyd led an interesting life. He was an actor prior to the war and joined the Navy because he thought that it might be good for a radio career. Instead, he ended up as the ship's barber. Floyd had a ton of great stories, but I wasn't sure if they were going to add much to my book. In the end, however, his story about cutting Ensign Jim White's hair ended up opening the book and is one of my favorite passages. Mike Rich provided me hours of interviews about the Partridge. His memories of the ship's captain, Adna Calden provided a huge amount of context and information on the unique situation aboard the Partridge. After researching the ship's logs at the National Archives, these men and others provided an amazing sounding board to elaborate on what happened aboard the ship in the weeks and months leading up to D-Day. And so, what did happen aboard the Partridge? This was the heart of the story that I was after. In 1951, The Kane Mutiny by Herman Woke was published. Shortly after that, it became a hit Broadway play titled The Kane Mutiny Court Martial. After that, a movie starring Humphrey Bogart was released. The stage version was also produced for television in 1955. This franchise was one of the most successful of its day. It stayed on the New York Times bestseller list for all 122 weeks. The film garnered Humphrey Bogart an Oscar. The story of Kane follows a World War I minesweeper whose captain loses the confidence of his crew, and during a tense standoff, a mutiny occurs. During a subsequent trial, Huig breaks down, and the men accused are acquitted. But we are left with an uneasy truth that even though Huig was flawed, the Kane's crew were culpable in his downfall. From the moment Kane was released, the men who served aboard the Partridge compared notes to their fictional counterpart. There were a number of striking similarities, starting with the type of the ship right through the behavior of the captain and the investigation conducted by the Navy. On the right is Humphrey Bogart in the iconic role of Captain Quig. On the left is Adna Calden with his daughter Lucy. Adna Calden was relieved of command of the Partridge by the Navy in 1944. I spoke with Lucy several times, and she was an invaluable resource, providing me with an honest assessment of her father, who struggled with the disappointment of his career after he was ultimately relieved of command. I was reluctant to ask her too openly about the flaws of her father. After all, I was comparing him to Captain Quig, not exactly a heroic figure in naval literature. But I always think of this photo because, in it, there is a flawed man— but ultimately a father who returned from the war. It was Lucy's story that helped me paint a fuller picture of Colden, who may have been the real-life Captain Quig, but was also a full human being, a father, a son, 
a kid from central PA who wanted to find a way out of a childhood raised in a saloon his father owned and saw the Navy as a pathway to something better. Another central character to the book is Jim White. He was a young ensign at the start of the war and eventually took command of the Partridge after Adna Colden was relieved of duty. Everybody loved Jim White, but knew little about him before or after the war. Tracking down friends and family of Jim was difficult because his name is so common. One day, just as I was editing the final draft of the book, I received cassette tapes with over four hours of interviews with Jim discussing the war. When the ship was sunk, White was severely injured and spent months recovering in Britain and then New York City. In the interviews, Jim shared his struggles recovering from a head injury and the years of alcoholism that followed him, from the pain and emotional trauma of losing his ship and Navy career. He may have been the hero of the story, but, like all real heroes, he wasn't perfect. And like Adna Calden, the end of Jim's war and his homecoming was complex and difficult. I started writing this book to find the real Captain Quig. Instead, I found the real Jim White, the real Mike Rich, the real Bill Ames, and the real Adna Calden. I wanted to create this video series because there are more stories to tell and more avenues to explore than what I could fit into one book. Some about the research that I did, and some of the offshoots that just didn't fit into the narrative of the book, but are fascinating just the same. For example, the number of typewriters in the U.S. Navy, the obsession of ice cream in the U.S. military, and our fascination with court-martial narratives. But most importantly, I wanted to tell more of the stories of the men and women that I came across exploring this one small tale from World War II.